New research has revealed what our young people are worried about. And the findings of the report, ordered by the Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission, show listening to young people is key to addressing our poor mental health figures. Our young people face stresses today that previous generations didn't. <coughs> and it's affecting their mental health in record rates. Social media and internet connectivity um, can be hard to break away. Insecurities, climate change, a lot of political changes, so people are, feel unsafe. The cost of living is like really going up and it's kind of getting out of hand. A new study has identified the four key areas affecting our young people's mental health. An uncertain future due to inherited social and economic challenges and climate change racism and discrimination, social media and online safety, and whānau wellbeing and an intergenerational disconnect. I think the more we understand about those drivers and, um, of distress and wellbeing for young people, the, the more we can then target our actions. The researchers summarised more than 100 reports and have come up with one big takeaway. If we aren't setting them up well now to cope with their mental health challenges and to come through a really tough period of time, we're, we're failing future generations of this nation and, and we're really robbing ourselves of a much brighter future for the country. Key to setting our kids up for life is managing their mental health early. For more on what we can do about this right now, we're joined by clinical psychologist Dr Dougal Sutherland. Thanks for joining us, Dougal. Kia ora, Janneke. Nice to be with you. So lots for our young people to worry about. Let's take an example, say climate change. How do we talk to them about something like that, something real, something legitimate, while making sure their mental health doesn't take a hit? Look, I think there's a real art in actually listening to people when they're worried about something. Um, a colleague of mine has a really good phrase. He said, um, uh, have uh, big ears and small lips. So listen twice as much as you talk and really listen to what the young person is telling you what their concern is. Try to avoid, if at all possible, jumping in with your wisdom and knowledge uh, about what you think is the right thing to do. Hear and understand what it is they're really concerned about. And it may be that you don't actually have the ability to solve the problem for them, but mm. listening to people, hearing their worries is a really effective way of helping them actually reduce their anxiety and, and give them the sense that they're feeling heard. So just listening is actually a really skillful and great start. And then stop there or go further? Well, it, it depends. It depends kind of what they're worried about. Um, and it depends what they want. And, and this can be a really useful thing to clarify. Um, do they want you to help them solve the problem? Are they telling you simply because they want to talk about it? And either of those things is fine, but they're quite, they lead to quite different outcomes. So if they want some advice from you, it's good to check that and say, you know, is there, are there some things that I can help with? Is there some suggestions I can make? No, 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 I just want to tell you. Fine, just tell me. Just let, you know, and, and create that relationship where a young person can come and talk to you about whatever they want. And if they want advice from you, then they can do it. Now, another key thing I was going to say too is we really want to help our young people to become active problem solvers. So that doesn't mean that you solve the problem for them, but it means you help guide them to their own solutions to figure out what they can do. And that's a bit of a complex process, but um, it's a really good guideline. Don't try and solve it for them. Help them to figure out how to solve it. Mm, maybe ask a few pointed questions. OK, yeah. let's talk about another biggie, social media. So if you had a teen in the house right now, what would you be telling them about that? What limits would you put in place? Luckily enough, I do have a teen in the house. She's, she's going to be 17 on uh, next Wednesday. Uh, and to be honest, 17 is too late. Uh, if I haven't done the groundwork now, then me putting in rules and limits around uh, screen time and social media, is uh, uh, that horse is already bolted. I'd be having those conversations way, way, way earlier. You need to be having those conversations the first time that your kid, your young person gets a phone or a device and talk to them. Uh, I think it's good to set limits, especially when they're younger, about the amount of time on it. But there's also uh, the ability for them to use those devices and social media wisely. Uh, so ha have conversations with them about the content that they're watching and about the message that it, they're getting from those. This is a slow process. This is a process that's a slow burner. Conversations like these take time to develop. Don't just charge in and go, right, what did you hear today? And what do you think about that? 
because they're probably just going to push you away. So again, it's about developing the relationship, hearing about what they are taking in and seeing if you can gently drop some pearls of wisdom in there, maybe just gently questioning whether that is the case, whether you should be worried about your image when you are uh, eight or nine years old, but just doing it really gently so that you don't turn them off from talking to you in the first place. Mm, listening, not imposing. Gotcha. Well, clinical psychologist, Dr. Dougal Sutherland, thank you so much for the tips. Go, cool. Thanks, Yannicka.